Hello and welcome. There's a glimmer of hope for one of Africa's longest running conflicts. The state of anarchy in Somalia may find some structure for peace following an accord just signed in Djibouti between the transitional federal government and one of its opposing factions. The civil war has been raging in Somalia since 1991 and warlords have controlled some parts of the country on and off, but little progress has been made in bringing law and order to this nation of around 9 million people. In 2004, Somalia's parliament in exile formed the Transitional Federal Government, or TFG, but factional ca uh, clans continue to fight it. After the powerful opposition group, the Islamic Courts Union rose to prominence in 2006 and took over large parts of the country, the US and Ethiopia intervened and supported the TFG. Tensions have remained high ever since, and the killings on both sides have been brutal, with civilians caught in the middle. Which is why some hopes were raised through the United Nations brokered peace deal between the TFG and one of its opposing groups. But today we ask, will this accord bring peace to this war-torn country? Don't forget, we take your calls on this show. You can reach us at the numbers at the bottom of your screen. But joining me to discuss the situation in Somalia is Dr. Abdi Samatar, Professor of Geography and Global Studies at the University of Minnesota and an expert on both Ethiopia and Somalia. He's joining us from Minneapolis in Minnesota. In London, we have Awale Kulane, an activist and media personality who heads the New Somali Youth League, a largely expat group of activists. And with me here in Washington, D.C., is Sadia Adan, who founded the Somali Di Diaspora Network to try to bring the Somali expat community together for the benefit of their motherland. Now, before we begin our discussion, let's go to our correspondent, Mohamed Adao. He's covering the peace accords, or he covered the peace accords signed in Djibouti earlier this week. He's in Bangoma in Western Kenya. So, Mohamed, good to have you with us. And I have to ask, what sense did you get that this peace accord is going to hold or, or make any significant difference? Well, Riz, I think uh, this accord signed in Djibouti on Monday just faces one of the problems many other accords signed on Somalia with parties agreeing on them have faced in the past. That is other groups, splinter groups, factions in Somalia's politics and in the war, outlawing it, saying they're rejecting it and saying they do, that it doesn't concern them and working around the clock to ensure that it fails. But that doesn't mean that the accord that was signed in Djibouti doesn't have its own flaws. Everything now hinges on the main sticking a point in this issue, the issue of Ethiopian forces and their involvement in Somalia. There is a big if here. The accord says the Ethiopian troops will withdraw 120 days from the time that accord was signed. And that is before, it, it, and they won't leave Somalia before UN peacekeepers are deployed. And here is where the, 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 the big issue arises because the UN is now struggling with a peacekeeping operation in Darfur, a conflict that, is, uh, uh, that has received more coverage and has received um, more international um, outcry than Somalia. Right. And with the issue in Darfur as it is right now, there is doubt that the UN will be able to take peacekeepers to Somalia in only 120 days. Mohamed, a very quick thought before we let you go. Was there enough of a representation, according to most people, enough representation of the opposing factions to make it a truly significant accord? Because it doesn't seem to have some of the major opposing players. Well, no, and that is the biggest problem right from the beginning. Only one faction of the ARS, the Alliance for the Reliberation of Somalia, which brought together the former Islamic Courts Union and members of parliament who splintered from the Somali parliament sitting in Baidoa, is what attended and signed this accord with the government. The Al-Shabaab, who account for a huge uh, portion of the fighting that's going on in Somalia, refused to attend and are saying they would not talk to the government. There is also a splinter faction of the ARS itself, led by um, influential uh, Islamic cleric, Sheikh Hassan Dahir Awais, who is in Asmara right now, and he has rejected the talk. Right. So the issue of attendance by other uh, opposition groups was a big issue right from the beginning. All right. But I think the issue here is, and what the UN wanted is, just to lessen the number of opponents the government has. Mohamed, good to have you with us. Thank you. Mohamed Adao, who's joining us there from uh, Bongoma, who covered the, uh, the peace signing in Djibouti, uh, the peace accords. Well, let's get to our guests here, and uh, let's get to Dr. Uh, Samatar first with the, the question for, for Minnesota. Uh, so what, ex what real impact do you expect from this UN-brokered peace deal? Again, as, as I mentioned with Mohamed, the lack of representation of opposing groups perhaps is one of the biggest issues. I would disagree with uh, Mr. Mohamed Addo on one issue, and that's the Shabab. Oh, 
I think we'll have to get back to Dr. Samatar in just a moment. But let me get across to uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Kulane, Awale Kulane, who's joining us from uh, London there, uh, and get your perspective on this. Do you feel that this can be significant enough, considering the lack of uh, representation at the table? I think uh, Mohammed Ajo mentioned that there is uh, a quite a, a difference between some people, some uh, groups within the Somali factions are missing, but a significant group is, has signed the accord, and it's a beginning for the Somali people well, to accept this and to work together to a peaceful situation. So to some extent, the groups that who were fighting have reduced in a, in a number, and to some extent, a new entity has come out of this that would probably bring out uh, a much more alliance between the, uh, the, the transition of federal, federal government and the alliance leaders who have signed this. So we hope and we continuously hope that this resolves in a peaceful resolution with the conflict that Mogadishu is happening, is taking place in Mogadishu today. Well, let's get back to uh, Dr. Samatar and just get your thought there. So you were saying that you felt that you, you disagreed with Mohammed Adao on, on the issue of the Al-Shabaab. Yeah, the Shabaab is uh, the portion of them that are not part of the conference is relatively small. We are talking about numbers in the in the hundreds, uh, 250, 350 uh, individuals who are fighting and who are quite tough. But I think uh, the key, this is a, it's a, it's a first step, and there are a this is a long journey, and there are many obstacles on the road, as Mohammed Addo said. Uh, but the key here is whether the United Nations will be able to bring its assets on the table to twist the arms of both the TFG and the sort of alliance for the re liberation of Somalia. If that's not done, and if it just simply becomes a bystanding mediator of a sort, if you like, a watchdog rather than anything else, then I think that will be a problem. The second thing here to note is the ways in which the monitoring is going to be done of the ceasefire. Unless there are serious United Nations monitors that could verify these things, uh, then I don't think this is step will be sort of a born mm. fruit, in my opinion. Let's get the London on the line. Hannah's been waiting patiently with a question. Hannah, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, sir. How are you? Thanks. Good, thanks. What's your question? Yeah, my question is, what's the point of the um, peace process in Somalia, where there's uh, in Ethiopia, in the ground, and also America would always attack us from the sea? And one more point. You know, we can, you and you are colleagues who are sitting beside you and the guys in Minnesota, and even I, in London, um, don't have family in Somalia. Luckily, they but the point is, innocent Somalis are dying. All no. the leaders, all the... Hannah, uh, Hannah yeah. let me put this to, to our uh, guest here in Washington, D.C., uh, um, uh, Sadia, uh, Sadia Adan. This is a key point. The people are being caught in the middle, and actually the worst thing is, I guess, that you have the men out there fighting, but the women and the children seem to be the ones really caught in the middle, and, and many of the victims who are killed. Absolutely. Uh, I want, before I go into that, I just want to say that uh, this uh, peace deal is a welcome deal for the Somali community. But the Somali community, whether it's those in the diaspora or inside Somalia, are not oblivious to the reality on the ground. And that is the fact that this um, uh, deal was not an inclusive deal. And when there is no inclusiveness uh, in any deal that's involved, then you have always those standing outside wanting to be part of the process. And as long as that is the problem, you have the vulnerable groups uh, suffering, such as women, children, elderly, and minority uh, clans who don't have anybody to represent them. As for Hannah's uh, question, I do have family in Somalia. I think majority of the Somalis that I know, everyone that I've met as far as long as I've been in the States or anywhere else, have families. And that's why we're all concerned and we want a peace established in Somalia. Mm -hmm. Let me get back to uh, Awale Kulani in London and ask uh, what the logic behind this, this uh, peace accord is. Uh, peace doesn't have to be enforced with a ceasefire, it doesn't have to start for 30 days, and then only lasts effectively for uh, a period of 90 days, uh, an initial period of 90 days, before really anything else can happen. Uh, what is the logic behind having it staggered like this? I, I think, uh, uh, I don't know, that that's a question for the people who have signed it, but the general logic would be, if it's 90 days or two months, whenever they sign the peace deal, we're hoping, this is a, a glimpse of what we can get, this is a glimpse of uh, hopeful peace for the people who are suffering, like Hannah said, in Mogadishu. This is uh, a, an opportunity to stop the bleeding within the, w the fighting that's happening in Mogadishu. So I think we cannot give up hope. We should uh, kind of participate and open up for any possibility of reconciliation and talk and peace mm. between the factions who are fighting in Somalia. And for the, you know, we continuously hope that every reconciliation kind uh, that happened before 
and the ones that are going to happen to the future end up in re resolving the problems within the country and most importantly the suffering among that's happening with the Somali people in, okay. in general. So right. we cannot give up hope basically. Well, well, Dr. Samata, let me ask you about the, this, this accord and th the, the accord states that Ethiopia is meant to withdraw its troops within 120 days from the signing and they're to be replaced by quote countries that are friends of Somalia excluding, excluding neighboring states. Which countries could be considered friends? Well, I think uh, quite a large number of Africans, South Africa is a friend of Somalia, Nigeria is a friend of Somalia, Algeria is a friend of Somalia, Malaysia is, and, and many other European countries and elsewhere in, in Latin America. So there will be no shortage of that. I think the key is the provisions say that one sufficient numbers of UN forces come to the ground and that's when the Ethiopians will vacate. The question is who's going to determine the substantial mm -hmm. numbers, given that the Prime Minister of Ethiopia has recently said that he has no intentions of withdrawing Somalia as long as there are what he called international jihadists. Let's get a call on the line from Minnesota and we've got uh, Dapadal on the line. Go ahead, Dapadal. Yes, I would like to, uh, uh, my name is Dr. Bedel Kariye, I'm calling from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Okay. And I'm also Executive Director of Somali Foreign Service Institute. Okay. I, would like to, I would like to ask the professor and other guests, if you can let Somalia and Somalis to settle their differences in traditional way, it could be fine, but there are international communities who have third part interest in the Republic of Somalia. We need Somalia and Somalis to understand and settle their political differences before okay. the international community engage. Let's, let's get that, let's get that, uh, uh, Dapadal, let's get that to the professor right now before we take a break. Well, uh, there is nothing traditional about the conflict that we have. It's not the old sort of a pre-colonial traditional sort of a conflict. Uh, and he's certainly right, the, the questioner is certainly right. But what matters here, when the Somalis were able to sort out their things, under the Union of the Islamic Courts in 2006, there was peace across the country without the deployment of the United Nations or anybody else. But the international community would not allow that to happen. So this is the best second chance. Hopefully, this is the first step in that second chance. And the United Nations has to bring to the table enough resources and sanctions against all parties to be able to make sure that they respect the very agreements which they have signed. If that doesn't happen, and if they tell the Somalis, you go ahead and do your own thing, well, then they sh wouldn't have come to where they are if they were waiting for the UN to tell them that. So I think there's a very, very critical role for the United Nations to play and that they have to begin to raise the resources to, demo to mobilize the troops to get in there long before the 120 days so that the Ethiopians can be told to respect the United Nations Security Council resolutions, which they have violated quite frequently. All right, we're going to take a short break here. More discussion to come, but we'll be back after this break. Don't go away.